Tonight we have a guest with us that came all the way from Jamestown. <laughs> Her name is Mary Dalton. And we have a long story about how we met on the internet. We've been keeping up a hot correspondence by email. <laughs> and I want to welcome you to River Landing. I'm happy to be here. This past summer, with our pandemic, it's been a, a distressful place to be living. A lot of us have had despair and uncertainty. And I began to search for some ideas about who would be an inspirational for us. And my thoughts went to Mary, uh, Martha Mason, who was a little girl of age 11, lived in a town called Lattimore, a small village of about 400 people. It's up near Shelby. She had vulvar polio in 1948. And when she was diagnosed, it had been about one week before that that her brother died of polio. So her parents were distressed and then some. She was uh, put into the hospital in, I think, uh, Morganton, and then in Asheville, and maybe elsewhere before she came to Greensboro. She was then put in the hospital in Greensboro that had been built on an emergency basis in about 45 days. The whole community pitched in and helped build this polio hospital. There were about 125 beds, and um, they had everything from small babies to um, adults. And we even had two babies born to victims of polio while I was there. She was in the iron lung which is a large canister-like machine that has the bellows on the end of it that continually pump air in and out that, that creates a suction of positive and negative, positive and negative, keeping her lungs inflating and deflating to make her breathe. Without that, she could not breathe. I came to Greensboro about that time. I had two reasons. First, I was, had been proposed to by my future husband in August of that year, and I graduated in September. So I came to Greensboro. I wanted to keep my eye on him. <laughs> and uh, I took care of Martha son, and also in various wards I would be assigned we had wards with several ages of children of the similar ages in, together, uh, and boys in one and girls in another. And of course, the uh, ones in the iron lungs were in a large, big large room that had several uh, of the iron lungs in there. I was there for less than a year. Uh, we were married in Ju January of 51, which will be 70 years coming up in January. And we then moved to Winston-Salem, where my husband had a new job there. And through the years, I have thought about Martha and wondered what's going on with Martha and if she was still alive or not. Um, I was busy. I, had four babies in eight years and did not work for 10 years while they were young. And there were, uh, but through the years, I would think about Martha and wondered if she was alive and I would hear some story about maybe she was. And then I heard that she had gone to college and uh, I'll let Mary tell more about that. And after about 25 years, I guess, just guessing, we were gonna, go to my husband's home up in the western part of the state. So we went by Lattimore and stopped in. I got in touch with her, told her we were coming. We stopped by and she was still living in the little, about a five room white house in this little town with the railroad track going by. 
Um, her mother took care of her at that time, but her father had died by then. And since then, they built on, a, a, there was a, another room built on for all of her equipment. And we visited her and she was thrilled to have somebody from the public hospital there to see her. And then later, my husband's older brother, who had graduated at Gardner-Webb before he went to Wake Forest, he was uh, to be honored at a banquet at Gardner-Webb College and they were to invite somebody. So my husband and I went with them there and we had a nice banquet and uh, they had honors for several of the graduates who had accomplished a lot in life and they were dis distinguished. My, my husband's brother got honored for that. And to my surprise, Martha Mason received honors for all the accomplishments she had made which I will let Mary tell you about that. And they had a short video that showed her in her home in the Iron Lung. And I think her mother was there in the audience that night. Later, I heard about her death in May of 20, 2009. And at that time, she had lived in the Iron Lung over 60 years. And which that is a world record so far as is known. Sometime later then, I, well, I, after I came to River Landing, I found her book, Breath, Life in the Rhythm of an Iron Lung. It's her memoir, and she wrote the book. Mary can tell you about that. This past summer, and as I was thinking about all this, uh, I Googled Martha Mason and found a DVD called Martha and Lattimore, and it was filmed by Mary. So we struck a, up an email conversation, and um, we back and forth and learned about each other. And tonight is so good to meet you in person. It I feel is. like we're family. <laughs> she lives in all the way to Jamestown, very close by. And she offered to come over and show her a film and to tell us about Martha. And I hope that our residents here can absorb some of the hope and the determination that Martha had as she lived such a defeated life, but she, was, she overcame it, she overachieved. She had an innate curiosity. She read books all the time. And, and of course, in the Iron Lung, the books had to be propped up on a little, sh little wire rack above her head. And then every time she wanted to turn the page, someone would have to come and turn the page for her until finally in the early 90s, they had invented a page turner that she got in the early 90s. And Mary, tell us what you want to tell us about Martha. Thank you, Lauren. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm always happy to try to introduce Martha to other people because Martha and I became very good friends, and not a day goes by that I don't think about her and miss her very much. And I hope when you do see the film that you'll get a sense of that spirit that she brings because um, she, she really uh, was probably the most remarkable person I've ever, I've ever met. How I came to know her, though, is I have my own little small town story that's not Jamestown, but that's right next to Lattimore. My mother grew up on a farm in Cleveland County, down the road from where Martha lived with her parents. And one day when I was I don't know, six, seven years old, something like that. I was, as kids like to do, looking at one of my uncle's high school yearbooks. You always like to look at the people and they look so funny in their pictures. And I saw this picture of this head sticking out of this big metal tube. And I had absolutely no idea what that was. And it really kind of scared me. And I ran through the house to the kitchen where my mother was doing something with my grandmother. And I said, what is this? What is this? 
and my mother looked over there and she said, well, that's Martha Mason, <laughs> just very matter of fact. And, and then I guess she must have explained to me that Martha had polio and she needed the iron lung to breathe. I don't remember anything else, I, but I just remember seeing that picture and, and then finding out that's Martha Mason. And Martha did, you know, you talk about getting in touch with her and visiting, but she also had a very private life because we talk about, you know, maybe she had the world record of longest person living in the, in the iron lung, but she didn't want to be seen as an oddity. She did not want pity. She, she thought pity was the worst word in the English language. Uh, she really wanted to engage with people as friends, but not as, a, as an oddity or curiosity. So as I grew up, um, I heard about her, and of course people in my family knew her. My grandfather, and, and this is how small towns were, I, maybe some still are, but you know, my, my grandfather was a farmer and a general contractor, and he'd drive by and check on things, and if he noticed that the Mason family needed a new roof. I remember one time when I was there visiting, all the, the men got together, and they had gotten some supplies donated and they put a new roof on the house because Martha's family needed a roof, so you put a roof on the house. That's how things were. And his, uh, my, my grandfather always checked by because his older sister, who died young, had been Martha's mother's best friend. So it was that kind of thing, but I personally had not, had not met her. And by the time I was, I went to Wake Forest, and then, you know, I had always heard about Martha going to Wake Forest and knew things about her. And by the time I had been teaching there for a while, I just got this very powerful feeling that I needed to meet Martha Mason. It really, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I really don't hesitate to use the word that it felt like a call. It was a calling that out of nowhere, it was just sort of this, got lodged in my brain, I need to meet Martha Mason. But I didn't quite know how to go about it because she was insulated from, from people. And so I, I got her mailing address and I wrote her this note and I said, I'm Wilbur Cabness's granddaughter and I'm good friends with Pastor Bracey and his wife who had been her preacher and, and I am good friends with Emily and Ed Wilson. And it turned out that Ed Wilson had been her favorite professor at Wake Forest. So the combination of all these things gave me enough credibility that she said that she would love to meet me. And so I went and visited with her on Christmas Eve, um, you know, to, in 2000, and we became fast friends instantaneously. Maybe you've had that experience before. I hope everybody's had that experience where you meet a person and you just click. You just click with that person and you feel like you've known them your whole life. And that's how it was for me and, and for Martha. So I don't really want to say too much more until people see the film because I think they'll get a lot of her background and, and you know, her history. I, I will say one thing that, is, uh, that, that speaks to what, what you were talking about and what our conversations have been to about Martha. Well, I think I'll say two things. One thing is that as a little girl, Martha was very active. She loved sports. You know, she was riding a bicycle. She took piano lessons, but I have this picture of her playing the piano where she looks kind of, <laughs> but you see her out on her bike and she was just, you know, fearless. Of course, when she, after she had polio, she couldn't do those things anymore. She had to redirect everything. It's not unlike what everybody goes through if they live long enough. You can't do all of the things that you used to be able to do. But she figured out things that she could do and made the most of those, those things with her life. She learned to live the life of, of the mind. And there's a story uh, that, that's, in the, that's in her memoir, that's, uh, which I highly recommend. Everybody should read her memoir. But uh, is, she also tells it in the film, which is when she was in the hospital in Asheville and her mother, uh, 
back then, some of you may know, parents weren't allowed to be on the polio wards much. They could come visit on Sundays or something. But Martha's mother was determined to be there, so she took jobs at the hospitals where Martha was, whether she was sweeping floors or working in the cafeteria or whatever it was she had to do, she did this because her attitude was she had lost one child, she wasn't gonna be apart from her other child. And she watched very carefully and learned everything she could about Martha's care so that this, when this opportunity arose in Asheville, they were closing down the polio ward, the epidemic had subsided, let's hope our pandemic will subside too. Um, and, and they were closing down the polio ward and the doctor came in and said to Mrs. Mason and to Martha, you know, you can take her home if you want to, but don't expect her to live, but maybe a year with the iron lung. <laughs> And he looked at Martha reportedly and said, how do you feel about that? Her mother was eager to get her home. How do you feel about that? Can you live life as a vegetable, not able to move from your neck down? And Martha, who's 11 or 12 years old, looks this doctor in the eye and says, no, but I can live above it. Yeah. And that's what she did. Yeah, that was a quote that I took to memory too. I can't live with it, I'll live above it. <laughs> and I don't, I think really I'd just like for you to be able to meet Martha now. I mean, do you think we're ready to I let the film ready. roll? I think we are. Many years ago, after she was stricken with polio, uh, I started visiting there. We got acquainted. My brothers uh, helped a lot in the situation with the iron lung and the uh, generator that kicks on when the power goes off. And uh, we just started seeing each other, and I paid her visits. And you know, if you're down, She's a good morale booster, and she's a good friend. We, we talk confidentially about a lot of things. It's just fun to take something to somebody to enjoy with them. When you are confined to a room, you still want to know what's in the world around you, and I'm interested in always showing the beauty of the things growing around. She always cares. See, we decorated the outside and she can't see it, but we video and we uh, take pictures for her to see. And I tried to match this ribbon with what we used outside. Well, we get up, we eat breakfast, then we take a bath. And then after the bath, I brush her teeth. And uh, she reads a book over top. I turn the pages when she says turn the page, you know, while I'm giving her a bath. The phone usually rings and uh, she said, she'll tell me answer it or not answer it. And that's what I do. I'm supposed to answer it if we're not real busy. If we're busy, we don't answer it. That's 
one of the beauties of it. I know almost anyone can manage uh, can manage what I need done. But with our lung, it basically is a is opening and closing um, these clamps that you see on the side and bringing me out and doing uh, the general care and then as far as, as uh, the machine itself it runs with a small motor and a, a transmission that uh, causes the wheel to turn in the right direction to manipulate a, a bellus even though each, each machine sounds and feels a little different within 24 hours it's uh, it's part of the landscape and one of the good things about an iron lung is it's that it's iron it's, uh, it, it's, it's like a uh, really tough, low maintenance machine. Another thing, it's not invasive. I don't have any tubes in my throat. I don't have any tubes anywhere. Therefore, I'm not susceptible to a uh, virus or bacteria or what have you. That many people in my situation with the more, uh, more sophisticated things have to deal with continuously. I can speak at my own uh, speed and, and uh, some of them have a lot of trouble talking. Hey, Hi, Martha. How are you? What's going on? Oh, well, I ran out of mums. Jack Frost got them. So I gathered some greenery to make a basket for Isn't you. Isn't it beautiful? Yes, and I have holly and mandina berries. Perfect for the dance. Mm. Yeah, that's a good we, place we to need put something it. For it. Right, that's the spot. And that's where Ma always puts your greenery at Christmas anyway. It's on the desk. The early years were, I guess, as idyllic as, as you or I or anyone could write about, even to the point of, you know, this is too good to be true stuff. And uh, then, uh, then we hit that wall. I had a brother, his name was Gaston, and... Uh, uh, he was two years older. He had polio when I did. Uh, he died, uh, I guess, four days, three days before I went to the hospital. His funeral was one day, and I entered the hospital the next day. Hello. Hi, Bob. Hi, Martha. How are you doing? Good. How about you? Pretty good. Um, I got mail, and this time you had quite a bit. Looks like a, good stuff. Looks like you've got a gift here, or you've ordered one to give, and a couple of Christmas cards, and you, well, there's a bill from Duke Power. And it wouldn't be complete if you didn't have something no, we from, need from Walmart. And here's the First Baptist Church bulletin. Thank you. Where do you want me to place this? Just place it right there. Oh, okay. Well, I, I really can't stay. I, I've got a lot of obligations, and I, don't, I can't. I don't know how I'm going to get them all done. And 
I, I really don't have time to stay. I can help with you. But, uh, well, well, I'll sit down and chat for a minute here. Um, I am so pressed for time for this season of the year. I don't know how I get myself so involved, but do you, do you have any suggestions how I could go about making sure I get all this done? Just enjoy it and go on. Well, that's what I need to do and not let it bother me. It's a season for... Uh, well, you're right. For fellowship and friendship. See, parents are not allowed ordinarily to be with chores when in, in the phone unit. And I suppose as much for them as for me, but a lot for me. Uh, because gas to the stone. Every time I would open my eyes, one of them would be sitting there. And uh I, was, I think I think that was so reassuring. You know, I was not abandoned. Usually, my dad had his hand on the on my head, or uh, my mother would be stroking my hair or something. But I knew they were there. And see, I lost gas, but they assured me I would not lose them. And I think that's one of the reasons that I survived. The doctor told my mother that they could bring me home. And she was surprised. Usually, I've been used to doctors telling kids they could go home, meaning they left with no more than a new pair of shoes and a brace. And that was going home. And that was a pretty good deal, you know. So I anticipated when I would go home that that's what I would have, too, probably. But this year went by in the hospital. And um, that just didn't happen to me. So uh, when he came, he said, Do you think you can live? with being inactive, being a vegetable, being in an iron lung for the rest of your life. He said, that means I don't move from uh, my neck now. And the report is that I know, but I think I can live above that. See, that same doctor said uh, she, she won't live longer to be prepared for not longer than a year. Well, you know, here it is 55 years later. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still around. You know, there was certain uh, debate among my friends about coming and and Pat, who's a close friend, still is, uh, said uh, something like, well, it's still Martha. It's just in a different package. I've been working 25 years with her. Because she don't have nobody and I don't have nobody now. Well, hey, Miss Horn. Hi, Ginger. How you doing? I'm great. How about you? I'm doing just fine. She taught me how to read again. I did not know how to read. I say, I don't see no barbecue. That, that's cheese. I can read a lot better than I did. I get regular and barbecue. Merry Christmas. Okay. Or 
doors opened uh, places for me, avenues of, of the intellect that I didn't know existed, and taught me how to learn. Education, I think, is the process by which you earn that. It's not something that you go out and drink a couple of beers and, and, and then you feel happy. I'm talking about lasting, uh, ongoing concern for others as well as self. Too long after I came home from Wake Forest and was all set up to become uh, the great writer that, that uh, I knew I could be. Uh, my father had a massive heart and he was 50 years old. At that time, a heart attack uh, was not like now. You stayed in the hospital. I think he said at least six weeks. Then when he came home, he was uh, practically just out of everything for another six months. I mean, he couldn't, couldn't do a lot. Uh, my mother had to take up the things that they had both done. Well, she, the best she did, though, my basic care, and that was about it. Because there was just no time for anything else. Not to mention energy. It's a, I guess I didn't think much about energy at that time. But I did think about time. And there have been times when, when I was almost bitter about that. Not quite, but almost. But then, in retrospect, even that was good. Because it gave me an opportunity to, to get to know my parents. Not as parents, but as people. As individuals. As people that couldn't always fix everything. And, and, and couldn't always say, well... You know, it will be okay, or uh, they could no longer do that. It was like now we were three adults, and I felt a responsibility to see that they didn't have more than they could handle. And they had done so much, I think, to try to make me want to live and to keep me living that uh, they deserved a break really. This is sort of um, the meeting place. This is where everyone comes when they want to know something. They bring their girlfriends or boyfriends to Martha to see not only the voice but the look of approval. There's some some joy in uh, in even bad days. I don't mean that to sound like Pollyanna. And I've been accused of being Pollyanna. Determination can conquer a lot. Um, she has a great determination for anything. She's um, not afraid. I, mean, I, I know the score. And I know what I'd like to have done. I would not have chosen living, uh, living my life in iron lungs. But that's that's what I got. But when, when you get that, uh, then that's what you deal with. From the first to the end of the year, it usually goes from different holidays of parties. We have our own little house parties a lot. Hello. 
See, this is a, a tremendous blessing in that I have a wide scope. All my friends are not one thing. You know, I know a certain number of attorneys and a certain number of law brokers, I'm sure. My only complaint about the computer is, why didn't you come earlier? First place, it's opened up so many uh, places I wanted to go. Yeah, let me see my like number one, I can okay, write now. I don't have to wait for uh, anyone's convenience. Or, uh, and see, I can even write personal names. That maybe I don't want that third person, regardless of who he is, involved in. Now, are you wanting to change the font? And that's, that's number one. And number two is the internet. Uh, internet is uh, like living in a library. Internet Explorer. Page down. Page down. I think living in my head, not living physically, as other people do. And I think that's been much easier because I am a head person, intellectually speaking. And I don't consider myself an intellectual. I consider myself a searcher, a seeker. I'd like uh, uh, a Kirk's way. You want peppers and onions on that? Yeah, peppers and onions and all, everything, and I want it to go. Okay. She's special. And you'll get me emotional. Don't want it that. And I, I, I don't need to do that, but she is, uh, she's, she's probably the most remarkable person I've ever met. She's our little town's uh, treasure, our crown jewel, I guess you'd say. Hello, Jack. Hey. I brought you supper and a poke. Oh, good. We're, we're eating tonight. Yeah, we're eating hey, We're eating uptown. She steers the conversation to where she wants it to be, and because of that, she's exceptionally well informed. When I get there and I, and I leave, then I found that I've been talking about me all the time. So then I, the next time I say, I, I'm going to vow, by God, at this time, I, we're going to talk about Martha. And I start off on that, but before you know it, she's already got it back to where she's talking about me. So she's, a, she's just got some kind of unusual knack or something or whatever. I decided early on that, uh, that one of my objectives would be to make people not notice or at least not dwell on and I know I mean it's there it's not like I'm trying to hide it so I'll make them forget that they're in the presence of all this machine you see here you are right back in that same thing I talk about all the time you talk about me and I want to talk about you she's my favorite dining partner and I I've dined with a lot of people, including General Eisenhower, and Jimmy Carter, one-on-one, -on -one, and big-time folks if you want to drop some names. And she's still, she's, she's the most remarkable and my favorite dining partner.
have a fog. to see her uh, my friend my best friend my, my mother my helper my secretary uh, and to see her fade out like the Cheshire cat and become what she became that's 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 big that's painful. In her eyes, I was uh, really a split, a split person. Uh, sometimes I was her mother. Sometimes I was an infant, Martha. Sometimes I was uh, the Martha of today. Almost all of us now have, uh, at some point, to deal with some form of dementia and parents, grandparents, whatever. And ourselves, maybe soon. And uh, I think uh, the key to that, at least for me, was to keep them involved. You don't put them in the other room and say, watch TV or whatever. We had her at everything we did. Look, look at all she did for me. And the very least I could do when the, when she had a need was to see to it. But that was such a little compared to what she had done for me. I think aging humbles you. Makes you become more, uh, much more aware of, of where you are. And you're much more grateful for uh, who you are and where you've been. Something happens to all of us. Mine is more visible than yours. But you have to deal with your things too. And Joe Blow does. So we're, none of us are... Uh, exempt from things that would make us extraordinary people if the world knew the story.
you, Mary. Let me turn your mic on. There we go. Okay, thank you, Mary. Well, I'm glad that you like the film. Wonderful. That that just helped fill in so many gaps. I had little stitches of her life through the years, but this told me so much more about her community and how they accepted her and all they did for her. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, it did mention that she went to the two colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in the book, it tells that when she went to Wake Forest, I think it was, that they took her iron lung in a bossed bakery truck. Yes. Um, to Wake Forest. Um, and she graduated from Wake Forest in 1960. Yep. And, of course, she didn't get the computer until 90 some. No. And she was first in her class. Yes, yes. So the way that worked, it was, it's funny, since so many of us are teaching online now and students are taking class online, Martha lived in faculty apartments with her parents. Um, her dad had gotten a job in Winston-Salem for two years and taken a leave of absence from his other job. And they set up an intercom system. So it was an early example of distance learning. She would be in the apartment with the intercom and she could hear what was happening in the classroom and she could participate. And her mother would be her scribe and take notes and her mother would type her papers and, and, and everything. And it was, it's, it's quite, it, it, it's interesting that she says that because everybody else thinks of Martha as an intellectual. There's the point in the film where she says, I don't think of myself as an intellectual. I think of myself as a seeker. And uh, she's just a lot of fun to talk to. I feel like I've just had a conversation with her watching the, yeah. watching the film again. Yeah, the book mentions that she also went to Vanderbilt University for a short while to learn some of the technology of uh, Communication? Like well, I think when she went to Vanderbilt, they flew in a plane, and I think she went because they were hoping that there was some kind of experimental treatment that they might be able to use to give her. You saw her, the picture of her in the contraption with her arms. I think they were thinking that there was some kind of experimental treatment they might yeah. have been able to get her some use of her hands, yeah. but that didn't come to pass. I think she may have tried some sort of respirator that went around her chest that would expand and mm -hmm. contract. Um, now we did have patients with an iron, uh, with a rocking bed. Uh, I think she tried that too at one time. It was a bed like a seesaw where the head would go down and up, down and up. And I, I had patients on that. That was in fact, one of the patients uh, was discharged that lived in Greensboro and I'd go over to her home and and see her and she would be rocking and my children were amazed at this rocking bed going up and down and wondering what it was all about. Um, but she, she's one that had a baby while she was in, a, in an iron lung. Um, this has been most interesting um, and I think that uh, here at River Landing we need to think about what this lady faced and what she what her response was, how she lived, lived above it. She did not let it t hold her down. Uh, she had a strong faith in God too, and her family was a very devoted Christian family, and um, they, they helped give her faith. And she, um, and I really think that here at River Landing, we need to continue to think about Think positive, think uh, about uh, being mentally and physically active. Uh, she has such a curiosity. Uh, computers are wonderful for people with curiosity. If you want to know something, you can look it up and you can learn a lot from that. And if you don't have, there are com computers in the library and somebody could show you how to use that to, to learn interesting facts about life. But um, I just hope that we will um, and keep the faith and we know who holds the future and just know that there are better days ahead. Um, 
only the Lord knows what he has in store for us, but um, hopefully we'll live above it and have a good future here. And we have all these activities here that we've just built a new wellness center. We have all kinds of activities that can be involved in. And Brian is our activity director, and he's going to keep us going. <laughs> he doesn't want us sitting around. <laughs> okay. I appreciate being here, and it is a beautiful place. So I appreciate being able to be here and share Martha's story with you. Yeah. Good, good. Very good film writing. Thank you. You are a professor of communication? Yes, I teach at, film and television courses at Wake Forest. At Wake Forest. Yep. Yeah.